on this episode of May TV. You look at the terrain and you see how dry it is. So yeah. it's, been, it's been quite a while since they've been here. But as you, as you go along, yes, you learn to run camps. Last one I had was, there was 300 guys. Culture isn't, it's not what we have or the items necessarily in our room. It's about who we are as Métis people. It's about how we carry ourselves. It's about who we are in our community. It's about being proud and installing that into our kids. Tanze, hello, Pitikwe. Welcome to May TV from Dawson Creek in Northern BC. This episode will feature some amazing Métis from this area. Let's start off with the director of Region 7, Paulette Plamond, with whom I had a conversation at a community barbecue. Minister Flamond, I want to welcome you to the show today, to May TV. Very glad that you're able to make the time to be here. Thank you very much, Danielle. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Dunaza people that we are here today on in Fort St. John, as well as the local Fort St. John Métis Society and Kelly Lake people. So Minister Flamond, we're, we're standing in this amazing structure here in Fort St. John, and there's a Métis connection to, uh, to this building. Tell us a little bit about that. It was built by Calmar Construction, based here in Fort St. John, and Christine, who is Métis, is one of the owners of Calmar. So it's a real privilege to be able to be in this building, and we're having an event tonight for about 60 people. They're gonna be enjoying a dinner. So it's wonderful to be able to have this facility to be able to be here and to celebrate her work as well. Wonderful. Well, this is my first opportunity to be here in Fort St. John and in the Northeast. I'm very excited to be here and to have the whole May TV crew here with me. In the past, we've had ministers on the show and what we've asked them is to tell us a little bit about who they are. So to get away from being just the politician and, and the person, who is Paulette Flamand? Well, first of all, I'm an entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur most of my life when I, since I was a small child, always coming up with ideas on, in business. Um, as well, since 2002, I ran the Northeast Aboriginal Business Centre here in Fort St. John. It is a non-profit organization that assists Aboriginal entrepreneurs to start or to expand business, as well as we do a lot of classes to engage people in entrepreneurship to find their strength. I've owned and operated a business here since 2008. Actually, I have three businesses here in Fort St. John, one being Scoop Clothing. It's a clothing store for women established in 2008. I also, as well, have a farm called Boreal Gardens that was established about four years ago. So we produce uh, local uh, food. It's on a permaculture farm. So I really love to like grow food and I love to assist entrepreneurs and I like to always come up and think about different ideas for businesses. So now this, this is a very entrepreneurial part of British Columbia. I mean there's a lot of uh, the economy you can just tell is, uh, is, is thriving here and, and there's a lot of Métis people up here not only in Fort St. John but in the entire Northeast area. What does it mean to you to when, I, when someone says you're Métis, what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, I'm very proud to be Métis. I was born in Saskatchewan to two Métis parents. My mother, La Rose, her last name came uh, from Camperville. And my father, who is a Flamand, actually came from the Balliford region. So I have Métis on both sides. So I always knew, and we were actually, we lived as squatters. Uh, so we were road allowance people. So I grew up in a two room cabin with no electricity, no running water, um, and had to live off the land. So I've always been very proud to be Métis. So now you're an elected official, so what uh, precipitated you getting into politics and ending up being uh, the Minister of, of Health for Métis Nation VC? Well, I've always wanted to be involved in politics and I've spent 30 years on boards. So I've always had that wanting to be an elected official. And um, I just decided that I wanted to do it. I was actually at the Supreme Court, the Daniels decision. I was actually the third person to get the writ. So I came down on the Supreme Court steps. My photograph was all over, you know, probably North America at the time. And I really made a decision at that time because I really got really excited. It was a very emotional day, you know, crying, joy, all of that. But I really believe in the rights of our Métis people in this country. And so that was one of the reasons why I got involved in the last election is that I wanted to help to establish those rights. 
Now you sit around the cabinet table and one of the things that you're dealing with now is the whole issue of self-government for Métis people in British Columbia. Tell our viewers a little bit about what your cabinet is doing to move the Métis people to, to self-government in British Columbia. Well, first of all, it's a big negotiation with the provincial government. So we have to move that government in order to be acknowledged. But I mean, it's very important to all of our cabinet members that we have inherent rights. I mean, we have our rights that you know belong to us and that they get established in British Columbia. So our cabinet's doing lots of work um, on that, uh, pursuing that, and that's the reason why that I ran, is because I want to see that happen. Now I mentioned a little bit earlier that you're the Minister of Health, so that's a very large portfolio, and you've been living through, in, the, in your term as Minister of Health, the pandemic, yeah. uh, COVID-19, um, and now we've been dealing with wildfires in the province, but I'm going to focus a little bit on the pandemic itself. What have been some of the challenges that you've faced as Minister of Health, um, not only around the pandemic, but just health in general for the, the people of the Northeast and around the province? Well, I think one of the biggest issues that we have facing us right now is to get more people vaccinated. So, um, you know, whatever we can do to, you know, encourage and give that information to our people so that they be able to have access to the vaccination. So I think that's the most important um, roles that we have, as well as I really believe and have passion for our elders. We have a lot of elders in our province who Métis elders, you know, that are actually living, you know, potentially in poverty, right? So I think one of the biggest challenges and my biggest hope is that one day we'll be able to subsidize our Métis elders as well as all of our Métis people in the province of BC to be able to have access to medical care. Mm. Now, I'm just wondering, I haven't had an opportunity really to, to explore a lot here in Fort St. John or the Northeast, but for, for our viewers, let them know what, what are the kind of one or two key issues that your community is facing right now? Well, one of them is definitely housing. Um, we definitely need, you know, housing. And so hopefully one day that we will be able to have a Métis housing. Um, being able to have access to education. I mean, we live in the North, so that for any of our people that want to go study anything, they have to travel. So that's always a big issue, and it's very expensive to relocate to Kamloops or to Vancouver or to Victoria. And because we live in the Northeast, and it's very hard to get around here, as you'll learn, that you know we need to be able to have something more centralized. Well, Minister Flamont, thank you so much for uh, being on the program today. I know I've learned a little bit more about the Northeast, and I very much look forward to heading out and getting to meet uh, so many Métis people uh, throughout the province, and I uh, appreciate all the work you're doing as uh, Minister of Health and uh, Cabinet member here in BC. Well, be careful. Once you drink the water of the peace, you'll never want to leave. We're taking a short break. When we come back, Lisa Shepard talks with Métis cowboy and rancher, our next Katea Yak, Philip Dumont. You don't want to miss this. Here you go. Here you go. Don't you step on it, okay? Recently, we traveled to Merritt to meet Philip Dumont. He is a great representative of an ebbing tradition. Lisa Shepard rides with him. Be Phil. I'm Phil. Good yes, to meet you, you finally in real life. And I'll show you the animals. Wonderful. You can meet those fellas. Yeah. And uh, one, uh, one's a girl. Okay. The one you'll be riding. And the one I'm riding is the, the fella. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to take a look at them? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. So Phil, yeah. I've got some tobacco here for you. Yes. And it's not for you, Beth. Bless you, I'm ready. And it's just to ask if you'll have a conversation with us. I will. Wonderful. Oh yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So Phil, you were going to tell me about your family, like being around horses, how much were you around horses when you were we a had, lad? We had two, when we were younger, we had two horses that we uh, used to work with all the time. 
but uh, we had a very small, small farm because we were very poor people in our own time, eh? Okay. We uh, lived paycheck to paycheck type of thing. And we didn't get a bus out there. We, we couldn't get a bus to where we lived at. So what we did was we ended up uh, usually walking to three miles or uh, leaving at uh, 7.30 in the morning and going with my dad and uh, staying at the laundromat until school started. Oh, okay. Uh, nine years old, we were as country kids. What did that look like from morning to morning to bedtime? What was that like? What was the routine that you remember? Uh, uh, again, you know, like I'm pretty old now. But I don't have a lot of memory left, but <laughs> the memories I do have, you know, we were, uh, you did your chores when you got up. We had two milk cows. We always made sure we got the milk cows milk before we got going to school. Yeah. And, and was uh, that milk for your family or was that part, part, was that, that was, milk for your family that was all for or was our that family. part of Yeah, okay. we, we didn't do nothing commercially. It was right. all for the family. Just a living type okay. of uh, situation. So our gar our gardens were all we had our own garden. Um, the only thing we really got from the grocery stores was powdered milk. Okay. Uh, sugar in in uh, in 25 pound sacks and uh, oatmeal. We used to buy oatmeal, oatmeal in our in yes. big sacks. Did you um, eat a lot of wild meat? Like, yes. did your family hunt and trap? And yes, that's one of the biggest things about my family is we were we were quite uh, enthusiastic in the in a in the hunting aspect of life. We had okay. to do our own hunting all the time. So we learned to hunt very young. How old were you the first time that you hunted or trapped? Uh, I think uh, far, as far back as I can remember, I was 10. 10? Yeah, wow. 10, 11. So you didn't get in a lot of uh, video playing time then? No, there was no <laughs> such thing. As, like, you wouldn't believe there was, was the no game such of life. thing as so many of those wonderful modern things today. There were absolutely not too many of them in our day. Yeah. Uh, it was lucky that we had electricity. There was no having to go to a gym and work out, I bet. No. <laughs> our, 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 by the time we finished our chores, you weren't too interested in going to a gym, that's for sure. Yeah, I bet. Unfortunately, we lost my dad when we were quite young. He, he worked for the sorry. highways department. And, yeah. And, uh, he had a heart attack and died when we were I was 10. Oh, and that's cool. one of the biggest uh, downfalls in, our, in, in losing my wonderful culture was the fact that when my, uh, when my dad died, he was the one that was so enthusiastic about uh, the Métis lifestyle and, and um, the jig. And my dad was one of the most best fiddlers you could ever possibly no, uh, you know he went to many. He won many, many awards on fiddling, and, and um, he was very, very musically inclined. Yeah. So uh, when he, when he, we lost him. We lost a lot of, uh, a lot of the power that, that gave us the ability to understand the culture. We're at a swamp, oh, okay. and this little swamp is, is, is has so many tell tales and um, stories to what, what 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 where we were and what we're doing. So if we're looking for cows right now, we, we want to know how long ago they were here, and um, you look at the terrain and you see how dry it is. So yeah. it's been it's been quite a while since they've been here. So seeing that you look at this track here, it's a yeah. big track. Yes, you what can is see that? that? That's a bull. That's a bull. It's a heavy, 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 heavy bull. It was, it was here, and he was here probably a month ago. For, from from the you for, can tell that by looking yes, at the ground the, that he was the, here a month ago because of the, the how hard how hard it is around it. Okay. And how how hard it so is. So there down hasn't below. been any rain, and it's been that long. That's and, right. Okay. And you wouldn't have that track unless it was really really muddy and wet. So that tells you that th there's really been nothing in here for quite and a while. And so you're wanting to know where, when the bulls were here because you're trying to find the cows. We're trying to find the cows. Right. That's right. And, and this is a bull sign, so that, that bulls with the cows are at this point. Right. So 
you keep this place in mind, regard, knowing that they can come back. If I was to describe you to someone, the, I think one of the first things I'd say is, he's a really smart guy. Uh, but do you, have you always felt like that? I felt, no. Truthfully, no, I haven't. I've always felt that I was behind the times. I always felt that, like I was in a cage, hmm. looking out. And uh, I don't know if I can explain exactly what I'm saying, but when you, when you, when you got a, a situation where you don't really have the ability to learn properly, you you, you improvise. You take you, you make you take steps to create the world around you, and you you end up learning to live that way. Right. And um, sometimes it's not the right direction. Right. You make mistakes. You make so many mistakes in your life, and you realize that you have to pick up from your mistakes. You can't hurt by them. Right. You can't let them bother you. You can't hurt by the pain yes. of the past. You gotta learn, learn to create a new future. I've enjoyed this so much. Good so I've made something for you. Okay, that is, that is exactly what I'm looking at. <laughs> okay, I'll wear that. So that's a forget-me-not. That is and for sure. somewhere on there, I don't remember where I put it, but there is a wrong colored bead in there. Do you know about that? A wrong colored a bead? A wrong colored bead. It's our way of acknowledging that as human beings, we're very imperfect. Is that that one right there? Yeah, that's, yes it is, yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you so very, very much. It was amazing. It was an amazing time, you know. I didn't know what to look, look forward to. I was nervous a lot. Uh, I didn't sleep a few tiny nights, but to me, it turned out so well. We wish Philip many more years of riding. When we come back, Peggy Olansky and her brothers Dan and Glenn bake up a storm in Fort St. John. I am going to do the fall fair for 200 people. Peggy Olansky is a name synonymous with quality homestyle cooking in Fort St. John. Let's go meet her at the Sunflower Bakery, where she and her brothers, all proud Métis citizens, prepare for the North Peace Fall Fair. My mother and father are both Métis one from Peace River, one from High Prairie, and they met in 1941. Then they came here, I think, in about, the, the, that's when the army was here. The war was still on, of course, so they moved. My dad worked on the Alaska Highway, and my mom did too. She cooked. We worked in the kitchen and uh, in different places along the Alaska Highway. Then um, Glenn was the firstborn, then Danny, then I am the third. My dad named us girls and our last name was Pope and there was Peggy, Penny, Polly, Pammy, Patsy. Like, come on. We never did speak Cree. Our mother could, but we, we never learned as children nothing but English. So, and my dad could speak French. Well, my mom kind of both, but when they didn't want us to know what we were talking about, they certainly did. <laughs> but other than that, no. And then we just grew up, like I said, Dad would have dinner for us when we came home from school. We, were, we lived very close to the school, and him and his friend would go hunting and catch snare rabbits, I remember, and have rabbits for dinner, rabbit stew or cooked rabbit, and dough, he'd have dough, and he'd make dough gods or buns for, mostly dough gods, which is fried bread, right? And because uh, you don't have time to let it set and everything for the morning. And we always thought the rabbit was chicken. We 
just, we all just, you know, we each have a something that we do. Glenn is my, he puts up all my shelves and, and fixes everything. And my daughter came and um, painted for me. She came up and painted for me. And, and um, Danny is a gas fitter and, and that. So. I'm the dishwasher and I've been given a, I've uh, been promoted from the dishwasher to lead the dishwasher that enables me to do all the pots and pans plus the dishes. Brother Glenn spells me off now and then. Yeah. You know, we, while we yeah, spell well, each other take, off. He likes to take that claim that it's not really true. Yeah. Truly, I'm if whoever's my, here true. first. Yeah. yeah, if my son was here, he would say neither one of them are good. He said I have to clean up after them. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. for 30 years. I worked, started as, I went out cooking right away because I didn't want to clean or shovel snow or anything. So I went out cooking, yes. And I, you know, stayed out there and it was very good money. And you just learn as you go. Like I can't say I was good when I went out 30, 40 years ago. But as you, as you go along, yes, you learn to run camps. I've been, last one I had was, there was 300 guys. So I make this every day and then I freeze them like this and people come and buy a frozen meal. I give them a dessert, like a piece of pie and a bun. Whoever, whatever I don't sell at lunch, I freeze for freezer meals, like for older people, like a lot of seniors come and get meals. And like I say, my meals are big enough that two people, like those two older people I told you, they both have enough for both of them. There's lots. I am going to do the fall fair for 200 people. I am uh, need to get like 250 buns ready and make sheets of apple pie, four big sheets of apple pie. And uh, we have uh, 100 pounds of roast beef gonna go in and 75 pounds of potatoes and 75 pounds of carrots that I bought from the Hutterite colony, some friends of mine. And um, so we're gonna have all that ready to go. That's okay, I'm just gonna. Excuse me, excuse me, just excuse me for a minute. Hey, is it good? Is it good? Good. Working in the oil patch, of course, you know, our farmers, they farm part time and they work in the oil patch. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, a lot of them, of course, you know, attend the fall fair and uh, they know Peg's reputation. They probably ate at some of the camps she cooked at. Yeah. So, consequently, you know, they, they knew exactly what they were getting and they were quite happy and uh, willing to go there. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, that, that's right, yeah. Fall Fair it has been existing, it'll be 75 years next year. I think I came out one other time and then I have for the last two years. So this is the third time. You want pie and ice cream? You better have some. <laughs> The first year I did it, she called me out and she said, I've been coming here for 40 some years, 45 I think she said, because it's going to be their 75th next year. And she said, this is one of the better meals I've ever had. And it was just the same thing, you know, because I said, if you guys want to change your menu, you go ahead. And they said, no kind of covers everything, you know, your fresh potatoes, carrots, buns, apple pie, roast beef, gravy. You gotta have good gravy though. That, that's the one thing that will sell it. Everything else can be poor, but if you can smother it in good gravy, 
You're okay. <laughs> The Pope family exemplifies the resilience and entrepreneurial spirit of the Métis in Fort St. John. When we come back, I talk to Walter Minault, president of the Northeast Métis Association, to talk about COVID's impact on this community. Meanwhile, here is the Machif word for politician. Welcome back. May TV is in Northeast BC learning more about the Métis community in this area. Joining me to discuss some important topics is Walter Minault. Hi Walter, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. So we're going to start off with, um, with the pandemic, with COVID-19 uh, here in Dawson Creek. What have been some of the struggles and challenges that uh, some of the Métis people have faced as a result of the pandemic? Well, a lot of the struggles and challenges we've seen happening is uh, a lot of people lose employment uh, a lot of there's a lot of jobs here that are taken away like you know restaurants and stuff like that in the industry um camps were shut down to minimal uh occupancy so there's a lot of people not working and kept a lot of people at home um, a lot of social abuse that we've been looking at to try to deal with uh, depressions mm -hmm. uh, um, there's there's that, a whole bunch of different issues th th that's a lot that's a huge list that yeah. you've just given so how do you um, as a chartered community here in Dawson Creek, like how did you respond to the pandemic? Like what did you guys do once it hit? We, well, we tried to do best we can, especially uh, we had, we've only had uh, volunteers come in once in a while because we can't go into the homes. Mm. You know, um, a lot of the places you, you, we can't, we don't want to send our people into the homes in case uh, there is an illness in the home or anything to, like that. We got to protect our volunteers. So what we can do is, uh, what we have been doing is try to help them, you know, talk to some of the people over the phones when we can, uh, to try to deal with some of their issues the best we possibly can. Financially, we can't deal with a lot of this stuff. Because when you're dealing with drug and alcohol abuse and uh, um, depression and stuff like that, that's, that takes a lot of professionals to, to mm -hmm. deal with that kind of stuff. And those cost a lot of money to try mm -hmm. to put our people through that. And we realize a lot of that is created by COVID. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that when, when you're sitting at home all the time and you're around your own loved ones and everything, stress does build mm -hmm. up, you know. Um, you're not used to being in that environment all the time. People are at work all the mm -hmm. time during mm -hmm. the day. You're not spending that much time consistently with your loved ones mm -hmm. at all times. And then that creates, um, you know, stress. it creates a lot of stress and everything towards the whole family. And mm -hmm. we've, we've had, you know, families separate because of it. And I believe that's happening all over the province and mm -hmm. all over our country right now. So, so lastly, uh, last question for you is just around housing. I know you're very passionate about housing right. and I know that's something that um, you're trying to bring. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the work you're doing on the housing front here in Dawson Creek. Yeah, I'm also the president of Dawson Creek Native Housing as well as uh, my local president here. Um, <coughs> we have had a lot of issues with housing. Um, <coughs> a lot of people that, you know, the more they're staying home in their homes and everything with COVID, there's, there's issues within the home that we have to start looking after uh, maintenance and stuff like that because we do own quite a bit of units and they're all Aboriginal housing. We have approximately uh, 78 units here in Dawson Creek owned by Dawson Creek Native Housing and roughly 50 to anywhere between 50 and 60 percent of them are housed by Métis people. Mm. So we um, work with the Métis and status, non-status, mm -hmm. um, all Aboriginal people in, this, in these communities. We are one of the bigger um, agencies in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. We have more units than most of the communities up here, so we deal with a lot more, um, more, more of the Aboriginal people in the housing. Our biggest issue is there's not enough funding to keep them houses stable and, and making sure that our people are in low-income housing. The, mm -hmm. the, the, pro the issue with this is we've, we developed Knox Creek Native Housing as a low income um, program mm -hmm. to help people that single mothers, lots of, there's a lot of, now we find a lot of grandparents that are looking after their grandchildren in these homes and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So they need a lot more help because grandparents right now, a lot of them are on, on assistance. Mm -hmm. they, they, they only get their pension and stuff mm -hmm. like that and they're raising two, three young kids. Mm -hmm. So we need a program there to try to help these grandparents to, to overcome that, you know, that financial burden and to keep their homes uh, safe and a place for those grandchildren to live in. Mm -hmm. um, 
single mothers are going through a lot of stress staying at home all the time and dealing with these issues and the illnesses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of them problems with our with our housing and the most the biggest problem is the lack of uh, the funds to right. be able to keep and maintain these homes for these people to live in and to help our especially our elders that are raising uh, young children their grandchildren to help them financially to move ahead is, a, is our biggest problem with mm -hmm. some of them because a lot like I say a lot of them don't have a, a big mm -hmm. income but they love their grandchildren they're not letting their grandchildren go anywhere they know that's what Aboriginal people do they look after their yep. kids and they, they try to keep them within their family life and their homestead Walter thank you so much for for being on the show and and uh, I do hope that those issues around housing that you talked about are, are dealt with at the earliest opportunity well it was my pleasure to have you guys here and I'm hoping we can uh, deal with those together one day Sounds good. We'll be right back with a story about Indigenous early childhood education from Kelowna, where we visit Awawasak Achako's Head Start. So our children are learning about who they are. They're learning to be proud of who they are. Every day is immersed in culture. They say that strong roots make for strong trees. And for children, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, a strong early education program guided by elders and a learning system that is holistic and grassroots will go a long way in healing old wounds and fostering understanding. Let's visit Awasasak Achako's Head Start in Kelowna. them a good sense of being, a good sense of culture, a good sense of, of rounded, being able to know who they are, where they come from, and just even encompassed around the elders and learning so early and language and just that connection within the community. <laughs> are you still watering the trees? This is Awasasaka Chaco's Head Start. It's an urban Aboriginal Head Start program, so it's funded by the provincial government. It is a no-fee program for our parents, so parents don't pay any fees to come here. We are going for a trip in our canoe. Last week we actually made some birch bark canoe, so this is a really nice um, pairing to that. Yeah, we're just talking about going from trading post to trading post. We pile all of our belongings into the canoe. Some of the kids had animals with us, um, some sashes and drums. And just talking about going from one place, trading our goods for other belongings, food, some furs. Um, yeah, I'm sure paddles if we needed to trade. Awasak Chakos is just it's brand new. We're going on two years. We currently have for September, I've got 19 children on the wait list. Uh, for next year, I believe there's 21 children on the wait list and we have wait lists all the way to 2024. It's just been growing so fast. We haven't even really had to promote it in community. The center really speaks for itself. The staff are amazing. We've been really fortunate to be able to staff our center with Métis and Aboriginal staff which I'm really proud of. So a typical day the children arrive outside. We start our day in the playground. Um, then they come in and they have their morning breakfast. Pre the chef D is prepared for them. Um, they sing their prayer song and they sit at the table together and we eat a meal together. And then after that, we split the group into two and half goes outside, half does circle time. Our circle time is always has a cultural component. The children can sing in Cree and in Machif. And then we read stories and they do the basic ECE circles. But a lot of our learning happens at circle time. It's a time where we can connect with each other. Children can share. We're from Alberta originally but we were living in England for, you know, up until I was pregnant. So when we moved to BC and we found all these incredible programs, 
I was really impressed to see that the kids had an ability or the opportunity to learn about their culture. And she's learning things that, you know, my grandpa and her great grandpa remember. So she goes home and she'll sing songs that he remembers as a little boy. For her to kind of come out knowing more than any of us is a really incredible opportunity. Like, I'm learning new things from her and this place all the time myself. So. Our children are learning about who they are. They're learning to be proud of who they are. Every day is immersed in culture. And I always say to, to my staff and to people that I talk to about our center is that culture isn't, it's not what we have or the items necessarily in our room. It's about who we are as Métis people. It's about how we carry ourselves. It's about who we are in our community. It's about being proud and instilling that into our kids. So the children play with the cart all the time. They use it for all different things. Sometimes they use it to pretend they're camping in it. Um, sometimes they pretend that they're on the water because we've talked with the children about taking the wheels off and that the cart would float. Um, we've made Métis carts in inside of our centre before with the kids, so they're, they're well versed in, in what the cart is for. What do you think we, they would use to pull the Métis Stop. cart? Hunter, what do you think they would use to pull the cart? Do you think they used fox? Red fox? Yeah. No, red fox couldn't pull a Métis cart. What would they use? A horse. A horse, you're right. Well, this is our cubby area, and this is where the children come in in the morning. On the wall behind me you see the word hello and all of the words above it are hello in the languages of the children that attend our centre. This is our dramatic play area, so there's Legos happening here, um, we have babies here and the children can play here. Um, this carpet was actually given to us by Métis Nation, so it's got some buffalo and some core values on it. This is the um, art area where we kind of keep all of our art supplies. And this is our circle time area here. So the, the staff will sit and they do circle time once a day, sometimes twice a day with the children. They do calendar, they do drumming, singing, jigging, reading stories. We have an elder sitting at the table today with the children, um, Elder Maria Labocan, and she spends a lot of time with her children. It's really important to have an elder involved in our programs. Um, Awasata Kachakos values um, the elders and the knowledge that they give. My name is Elder Maria, otherwise known as Maria Labocan. My role here is to come and um, to, visit, to visit with the children and now they get to know me, which is really fun because when they see me come in my car across the, uh, across the parking lot, if they see me, they go, Maria, Maria, and they all come running. It's especially, it's especially helpful for the children, but also for the elder. There's nothing like uh, little children that recognize us and care for us and ask us questions. Sometimes when I come, we do drum circles, and so I drum and sing with the children. And one day I brought an old accordion, and um, they all took turns playing the accordion. So it's just that experience, and then sometimes I'll just tell stories, and usually the stories are my own stories that I just share with them. Well, the hope for the future is that, you know, we're gonna have, this is gonna be here for a long time. You know, Awasa Sacachacos isn't going anywhere. It's, it's going to be here, it's going to be at South Rutland, and that we're going to expand. You say goodbye! <laughs>What an amazing experience for the elders, teachers, and children. The future will have more empathy and is bright. We'll be right back to wrap up the show. Meanwhile, here is the Machif word for future.
Welcome back. It's almost time to wrap the show up, but before we do, I want to share some of the voices of Métis people from Region 7, Fort St. John, Kelly Lake, and Dawson Creek. Over to you, Callum. Thanks, Daniel. Over the past few days, I've been talking to Métis from a variety of backgrounds about what their hopes and aspirations are for the community. Here's a compilation of what I've learned. Tansi, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, my name is Dan Pope. I am a Métis citizen. I've lived here. I've been a, a former uh, Minister of Economic Development for the province. And I just look forward to where we're going now. It's glad to see this turnout here. Glad to see that uh, our own TV and where we've progressed as a nation of people. And I think that uh, the best is yet to come. And tell us a bit about yourself. All right. I am an elder. I dance in powwows. I'm the vice president of the Métis. Uh, married 52 years, uh, two daughters, one in Toronto, one in Nanaimo, five grandchildren. I'm an Aboriginal teacher at Nina's at Head Start, and uh, I love my job, and I love being a Métis. I'm learning to jig, <laughs> and uh, I'm learning to make bannock. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, hi there, I'm Carol Painter, actually, and I've been, I'm from Saskatchewan, Middle Lake, Saskatchewan, that's where I was born. I've actually grew up in Fort St. John all my life. I've been involved with the Métis Nation uh, since, well, I guess uh, 2002. I started with the local, and then I moved into working with MNBC, which I worked for them for quite a few years, and then moved forward into, I guess, the um, education system for MNBC for about seven years. Then I left, um, the Métis for a couple of years and now I came back. I was asked by the regional reps for the women to represent them up in the northeast region so I've been doing that now for three and a half years. And have you always known your Métis? No, I did not actually. Uh, when I found out it was Métis, my mother and father never talked about it when I was growing up. Um, so when I went to the Métis office to write a resume is when I first found out that um, I was Métis. Uh, tell me a bit about the sash you're wearing. When I joined the Métis Nation with the women, um, as a women's rep, we decided to create our own sash. And so this is the colors that we come up with. All across BC, the seven regions, we come up with all the colors. And this is how we came up with our colors for the sash. Very cool. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Callum is a proud member of the Métis Nation. And in future episodes, he will regularly showcase what the Métis really feel. Well, it is time to say au revoir, but before we go, remember this show airs on Joy TV and Faith TV at the times given below. We're also looking to tell Métis stories that need telling, and if you have one, get in touch. I'll be presenting the next show from our offices in Surrey next month, but until then, Mina Kawapamitan.